Just ahead on American Black Journal, we're going to talk about a citywide effort to get Detroit students to school every day. Plus, Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy and her father, Clifford, talk about his new autobiography on his life in the military. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts now. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. For nearly 100 years, Ally has been a part of Detroit, and we give back by volunteering and donating in our community. We have a commitment to diversity and increasing economic mobility in our hometown. At Ally, we're dedicated to doing it right every single day. <laughs> Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. Now that spring break is over, the push is on to reduce the chronic student absences that tend to increase this time of year. In Detroit, more than 56% of students are chronically absent. Every school day counts Detroit as a community partnership that is challenging students to create music, poetry, dance, and other videos to communicate the importance of showing up and being engaged at school. We from J. Lee Ross Leadership Academy. Every school day counts Detroit, and we challenge DCA. <laughs> I was raised under my mother's breast, taught to never hold my head down. When you fall, get back up. When you sit, sit straight up. Don't make the same mistakes as me. Right my wrongs, but the copy and paste didn't take long. The game is real simple. Sing a sweet lullaby, teach me to fly, swim, keep your head up and you won't die. I'm a woman, I say, but the game I've yet learned to play. I'm under the influence of you, but I feel as though the world is taking me away from you. Drugs, alcohol, gangs, I'm under the influence of education, so I can build a nation. We stay in school, and that's period. Somebody once told me don't listen to words Words ain't nothing but thoughts out loud Nobody thought I'd do nothing in life I see y'all require what y'all thinking now But to be honest I really don't care So go ahead and say it y'all can't put me down I want to be great so I study the great So I copy their cadence and mirror their style People been counting me out I'm counting my bars, they counting my sins I'm seeing what these people do for the clout I write it, record it, and do it again Hear all the talk, that's all word of mouth I want to see what they could do with the pen Tired of hearing what y'all talking about But I know as I grow I just hear it again. Every school day counts, Detroit. <laughs> Those are really great videos. Every school day counts, Detroit is part of a national initiative that also provides resources to help families get children to school. Joining me now is the head of the local campaign, Reverend Larry Simmons of Brightmore Alliance, along with community partner Christine Bell from Urban Neighborhood Initiatives and one of the funders, Tammy Jones of United Way for Southeast Michigan. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank Good you. to see yeah. you again. Yeah, yeah. This, is, this sounds like a really great program. I want to start with that number, though. 56% chronically absent. Uh, when you think about all the other negative outcomes that we associate with Detroit schools and public education and all the challenges that we have with it, you probably can start with that number. Yes, and that's the citywide number. That's right. not just Detroit Public School that's District. That's everybody. That's everybody. Charter, public, everyone. And the great thing about this is that community, many years ago, which is why I'm wearing this shirt to acknowledge the community's role seven years ago in starting this effort, 
identified attendance as a major problem, and out of that we came to find chronic absence mm -hmm. and to begin this movement, Every School Day Counts Detroit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we talk about the reasons that kids are chronically absent, uh, I think then we get to some of the, the drivers of poverty and other things in, uh, in our community. These things are not separate issues. They're all kind of interconnected. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, they're all interconnected, and and it's important that as we look at the issue that we understand um, that really being chronically absent is only missing two days a month. So, okay. so that it, that so can it's be, a pretty low bar. Too, yeah, right? it is a yeah. it is a pretty low bar, and so issues of transportation, health. Um, other issues of poverty and also the the school culture and climate that is what we've learned from parents and students are major are major issues driving driving chronic absence yeah yeah uh, and of course those bigger issues are all issues that United Way is really focused on. Uh, talk about your involvement in, in this particular program, though. Yeah, absolutely. So for us, we know that the basic needs of residents is continues to be a struggle um, in Detroit, but also across the Tri-County region. And so we do a lot of support around that, but recognizing that kids missing school is actually a real um, red flag. It's an indicator that a family needs support more mm -hmm. than anything else. Yeah. Um, and so it's a great opportunity then for us to say, if we know that kids are missing school, we don't need to wait until they miss 10 days. We can start when we see that they're missing two or three days in a month and start to do the conversation with families then to put wraparound supports in place. Yeah, and it's one of those issues that snowballs, right? Mm -hmm. You start mm -hmm. missing a day or two here or there, and eventually you can grow to, to missing lots and, and lots of school. Mm -hmm. And part of our research uh, showed that over 76% of the people in Detroit don't know what yeah. chronic absence right. is. Two days a month doesn't sound like much, but it accumulates to 10 uh, days, 10%, excuse me, uh, school year. Mm -hmm. And those two days a month can cause a student to get on track to drop out of school, not to read on uh, level, not to be able to succeed, and to get into more trouble. So the two days a month missing is the key message we're trying to get out to the community and asking others to share it with yeah. their friends and neighbors. Well, and it's a great idea to have children themselves, yes. Uh, yes. making the messages that you're going to send to kids, right? That's yeah. who they listen to yeah. more than Christine than and you and I are big leaders in youth development and have a whole after-school program around that. Yeah. And what we found when we listened to young people is they said to us, particularly high school students, why are you talking to my parents about it? I get myself <laughs> to school. Yeah. And some of our kids get their their siblings to school, so it was re it was really important. I think the effort and the messaging to to ask young people to share the message um, and to be a part of this. And we're really excited because the hope is that we'll train young people to actually do the messaging work over the long term. Mm -hmm. So they'll drive not only content, but uh, you know the the actual putting it up on social media monitoring um, and so we're we're really excited about that effort as yeah. well yeah you know uh, the, I used to cover uh, public education in the city uh, 25 well maybe I don't want to admit that <laughs> it, was, it was about 25 years ago uh, but but I can remember then that the absenteeism issue was more a focus at the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. right? We would start school in Detroit and it would take mm -hmm. weeks sometimes before mm -hmm. uh, teachers knew how many kids were gonna be in their class or schools mm -hmm. knew how many mm -hmm. kids they were gonna get because people couldn't get geared up to go to school. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I've heard of it as an after spring break uh, issue, um, which is w what where we, you're focused. What we discovered in the research is that there are peaks and valleys of absenteeism. And before and after holidays, you tend to be absent, but it still counts towards two days a month. Right. So even though it may not feel like you're doing much by extending your vacation late or starting early, it does. And the great thing about having kids send that message, uh, Jalen Rose Academy has already uh, done the videos you've seen. Uh, Detroit Academy of Arts and Sciences is working on some now. We have another 20 schools that United Way is connecting us with uh, shortly. So we intend to explode this through use of our children as the messengers for themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a great um, 
uh, addition and implementation that we got from our friends at Boulevard, which is our adv advertising partner. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, your work is, of course, in, in primarily in the Brightmore mm -hmm. community. Uh, talk about what this issue ends up looking like uh, in that in that community. You, you don't have a lot of schools left in, in Brightmore, <laughs> right? They keep getting rid of them. one DPSCD school. Actually, <laughs> right. there are um, now five schools left in the okay. community, okay. Uh, one high school. Uh -huh. But the, the how it impacts us is we see kids on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, we see test scores which are dropping. Almost 90% of our third graders cannot read at mm -hmm. third grade level. Wow. Mm -hmm. Really, you can trace that to chronic absence. Uh -huh. it's a, it is the best predictor of gra high school graduation mm -hmm. of any statistic that the we have. The absenteeism. The yes. absenteeism. Really. Yes. And so this is an important concept and uh, driving the message and the other programs. Mm -hmm. And without United Way and Skillman, which helped to underwrite this when nobody else would talk to us about this. When we first began this yeah. work, mm -hmm. no one want, all they wanted to talk <laughs> about was uh, average daily, daily attendance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, this young lady right here, and her current role and previously when she was at Skillman, Tammy was a key supporter with her leadership in keeping this movement alive mm -hmm. to others could appreciate And what was the reason that, that people didn't want to talk about this? So I think uh, average daily attendance, which is tied to the funding that schools uh, receive, uh, sure. Um, it masks chronic absence. So you can have 85 to 90 percent of your school, your students, with their butts in seats on any given day and think you don't have a problem because most of your students are there. But out of that 10 percent who's missing, some of them are missing one or two days. Some of them are missing 45, 60 days a year. Wow. And those students have a profound impact not only on their own academic performance, but also what's happening in the classroom. From behavior norms to also just knowing what's happening and keeping up with content, a teacher has to give those students extra time, and it draws from everyone. Huh. So people just didn't understand how the data can change and how important it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead. Oh, I, I would just agree <laughs> with what Tammy said. I mean, it's, it is... Um, I, and I just want to add, when, when we were talking about chronic absence, that, that is being out of school for any reason. Uh, mm -hmm. right. So suspensions, um, okay. excused, unexcused, yeah. doctor's appointments, mm -hmm. it's, it's missing any academic instruction. And so that's what also I think makes it different is mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's hard to conceptualize mm -hmm. that, right? right? Like right. for whatever reason, my mm -hmm. child's absent and that that could ne negatively impact their, yeah. their and the, academics. And the reason it's so important to reach out for those who come to understand this, because it was an aha for us. Mm -hmm. Two yeah. days a month, mm -hmm. that's all it takes. Mm -hmm. In every other part of life, 90% is good. Right. Mm -hmm. But in attendance, it's not. <laughs> it's it makes not. you chronically absent. Yeah. And just think, if, if I miss school today and we're talking about multiplication, when I come back tomorrow and you're talking about division, I can't participate in that I can't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And the teacher has now got to interrupt the education of the other students to try and catch me up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then day after tomorrow, Christine is absent. Mm -hmm. So it accumulates and slows down the learning of the entire classroom. That's yeah. right. And it's something that teachers, I think, recognize <clears throat> Mm -hmm. recognize very regularly is is having to do exactly what Reverend Simmons just said mm -hmm. and so it's really problematic. What's the school side of this? I mean you mentioned suspensions mm -hmm. is uh, one of the things that that keeps kids out of school. Mm -hmm. Are you asking schools to think differently or more about this than they were? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So when, when uh, Tammy and I were working on the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children uh, initiative uh, championed by Skillman, uh -huh. A chronic absence rose to the top of their list of concerns that have to be addressed mm -hmm. because of this. And to the credit of Detroit Public Schools uh, Community District and the charter community, both have embraced this and have huh. begun to implement attendance teams, have redeployed attendance officers in new ways, mm -hmm. and are recognizing that the early intervention, mm -hmm. uh, not waiting until the child is absent 10 days or 7 days, but catching them in those that month when two days have been yeah. missed, mm -hmm. that's when we began to work with the students through attendance teams and other interventions mm -hmm. uh, to get them to school. And we got social service agencies joining them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you say, uh, you use that term, uh, attendance officers. Mm -hmm. They were truant officers when I was a kid, right? Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and that had a negative connotation <laughs> yes. and it missed, I think, uh, some of what you're talking about mm -hmm. in terms of the reasons behind those absentees mm -hmm. uh, and, yes. and addressing those problems as opposed mm -hmm. to just going and catching kids and 
getting them in trouble. Well, and some of it is also the schools themselves having to think about their environment and how they make sure that it yeah. is inclusive and welcoming for students. Yeah. So if, for example, bathrooms are viewed as unsafe and students don't feel safe yeah. using the restroom during the day, yeah. sometimes they'll go home to go to the bathroom and they won't go back to school. Yeah. Right? These are real challenges that until the school knows, they can't do differently. Yeah. And so really thinking intentionally about the environment, but also the relationships, is somebody greeting those kids by name as they come into the door? Right. Are they getting that high five? Right. These are things that will drive kids to want to be in school, yeah. and they're part of the factor, too. And it'll too. cut down on the, mm -hmm. on the numbers. Okay. Uh, great work, and uh, thanks for being here. Thank great. you for having Thank you so much. Two days is too many. Two days is too many. That's a, <laughs> what a great phrase. <laughs> Just ahead, Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy's father writes about his life experiences in the military. But first, here's a 1968 CPT commentary on Detroit schools given by the show's host, Tony Brown. Volumes of studies on the Detroit public schools have all shown that black children in the inner city are deprived of the opportunity to receive an adequate education. These studies always point out the same things. Teachers who have the least experience, poor physical facilities, students receiving automatic promotions, and reading four or five years below their grade level. Then the studies are filed away. Nothing seems to get done. Time, however, seems to be running out. A different breed of black student now demands change. Studies of the typical black person who took part in the civil disorder in Detroit in 1967, showed that he was in his teens and believed that change will only come if it is violently achieved. Society has come to understand that rundown schools produce rundown citizens, and rundown citizens produce rundown neighborhoods and cities. It doesn't matter whether the student is black or white. If he is in poverty, he is the low man on the ladder. His name isn't important. He's a child of the inner city. When he's 10 years old, he still reads like a second grader, puzzled by words with more than three letters. He's shy in class and often falls asleep. His teachers call him a slow learner. He wonders why they don't understand him when he talks. The images in his textbooks are white people, and he is taught a history which only points out the contributions of white people. He's a black child in a white world, and he's poor. He's in trouble. Our city is in trouble also. We're doing business as usual in our schools, despite the studies which tell us we're failing to educate. Retired Colonel Clifford Worthy's new autobiography is titled The Black Knight, an African-American family's journey from West Point, a life of duty honor and country. His last name probably sounds familiar because he is the father of Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy. Recently I sat down with father and daughter to talk about Clifford's story of challenge, opportunity, and growth. Talk about how important that was that uh, the decision to go to West Point and the ability to get in which wasn't always available to African well, that, that was just it was almost like the get, get, get the opportunity to go that was thrust on me. Before that time, I had no plans about West Point. Uh, I didn't even know anything about the Army. I have no military background, family but military background. But I met a young man uh, at Old Main, that was before it became Wayne State, it was called Wayne, just Wayne University, who, who came and still had his uniform on. Cliff Worthy wanted to go to medical school until that young man told him about West Point. But in 1946, African Americans couldn't go there. Not until President Harry Truman desegregated the armed forces a couple years later. Congressman John Dingell Sr. offered Cliff continued support. He wouldn't let go until three years, for three years, until he got me in. And on July 1st of 1949, I entered West Point. And, uh, and you knew right from the beginning that I belonged to West Point. That was almost 70 years ago. <laughs> well, here's one right here that uh, shows a picture of me as a, as, as a senior cadet. That's as a senior. Wow, it's amazing how young you yeah, look there, uh, right? I didn't have any feeling of being um, oppressed in any way uh, at that time because it's, it's just a madhouse when you go to the 
uh, you know, upperclassmen are yelling at you, and you got to get your clothing, you got a thousand things you got to do. So I went through that process, and, um, and for, I can honestly say from the four years that I was there, uh, I never really felt that I was being discriminated against, mm. except in one, one area, and that was housing. When you got there, they uh, put you in companies based on height primarily. And, uh, and so they wanted to keep, the, for parade purposes, they wanted to look good by all the cadets being the same height. Well, except for the black cadets, they were all forced to, we were forced to live together even though one of my classmates was four, about four inches shorter than myself and the other one. And so as a result, he had to make certain adjustments to his Kate walk, the way he walked, the long stride. He was put into the middle of the formation to hide him. And, <laughs> but other than that, I, I felt no, no, yeah. felt that discriminated against. Again, this, uh, this theme that comes up again and again in the book and throughout your life of this, you know, dealing with challenge, uh, dealing with the, the kind of unexpected. Well, Vietnam was full of the unexpected things that you read about all the time, about uh, uh, the fact that you're fighting an enemy that you can't see, don't, don't know because they look like regular civilians. The uh, isolation of being, I was not, uh, not totally, but field artillery battalion commander, which consisted of three firing batteries, and those are, those are the, war, war, the war part of that battalion. And uh, they would be spread all over the, uh, the northern part of South, South Vietnam, and so you had to maintain contact with them, and they would be miles apart, and they had to op operate uh, almost autonomously at times because of, because of the time and distance factors. And uh, so that was a real challenge uh, with that. With it. And um, the challenge of, of the, the kind of fight you were fighting. For Kim, having a father in the military meant a different kind of challenge being constantly on the move. You know, when you're growing up, you don't really know that it's not normal. I mean, you, you feel it's not normal for you to, to move every year mm -hmm. and you have to get to know a whole new set of classmates, a whole new school, set of teachers, everything. Um, you really don't get the chance to participate in uh, different things because you know you're gonna be leaving the next year. But uh, for me, it was normal. Mm -hmm. What I think it did, though, I think it made me able later on as I was approach, approaching adulthood, be able to adapt to different situations pretty easily and readily. So you talk a lot in the book about the challenges of raising children. Um, what are the things that stand out for you in terms of what those challenges taught you? Well, of course, with Mark, my son, that was a big challenge. He right. was diagnosed as a special needs youngster. Back in those days, and even today, uh, resources uh, are very thin about what to, to help. Uh, kids like that and families like that because some of the resources that we, we dealt with they, It was a family affair, you know, they wanted to make sure that the families were all involved In fact, the, the kids had to go to the, se the sessions along with the parents. Kim has always oh, had a mind of her own <laughs> Doesn't I mean, everybody, uh, uh, everybody uh, supposed to? You know, <laughs> <laughs> he has a, a bit higher degree than most I, I remember when that. she was <laughs> She was 15 and she wanted to take driver's ed so she could could drive. I thought this was about you. Well, <laughs> he asked you questions too. I didn't write a book. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway, she wanted to uh, get uh, uh, driver's ed. Well, it, when you were 16, uh, you didn't have to pay for it, but when you were 15, I had to pay for it. Plus, I didn't really want her driving at 15 anyway. So I said, no, put my foot down. No, you're not going to, I'm not going to allow it. In my, in Kim's mind, I'm sure it was said, fine, I'll take care of it. So she. The very next day, she had a job at McDonald's and she paid for it. So <laughs> to, that, that's, to make sure that's she had typical. Of I came home with a driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> what What's the message that you think resonates about this story in 2019? Kids want to succeed, no matter what their background, race, whatever. It's just that uh, accessibility, and uh, one of the points I wanted to make in the book um, is that. You never know when the, you're going to have an opportunity to do something. Seize it. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. and, and uh, uh, make the most of it, realizing it's not going to be perfect, realizing that some of the people you're going to deal with are not good people. Mm -hmm. But then there are some good people, because I can think of many examples, and they're all featured in the book, in the book. about how people have helped me along the way. And it gets back to what you were talking about, mm -hmm. about character. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. The really, if you don't have any character, it's going to be very difficult for you in this life, and or it will lead you down the wrong path. But, and I think that's what what comes from some of the strong institutions of today, whether it's a military institution or or another institution. If you, they can instill dignity and character and kindness and compassion, and if you can instill all that into your children and generation to generation, we really will be better at some point. That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can go to AmericanBlackJournal.org for more information on our guests and to check out past episodes. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Maryland cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. For nearly 100 years, Ally has been a part of Detroit, and we give back by volunteering and donating in our community. We have a commitment to diversity and increasing economic mobility in our hometown. At Ally, we're dedicated to doing it right every single day.